So uh, I have nothing to disclose. Our objectives are clearly listed here. We won't go through these one by one, but we will cover them all. We're going to start off with number 10, a methodical clinical exam is your best tool. Uh, so doesn't mean it's your necessarily your easiest tool to use, but it, it certainly is your best and, in my opinion, your most important tool. Um, we deal with pediatric patients, right? These exams are challenging. Um, there's no easy part of these, especially when they're really young. It's different than our adult patients. These kids can't always articulate, um, sometimes articulate at all. We're, we're having to also manage and balance the family. So keep in mind that age-appropriate exams, uh, keep the toddler in the parent's lap or right beside them. Even our younger school-age children will do a little better with this. A little distraction can go a long way. This is a picture of our child life specialist, Lori, who uh, we have a, we're blessed to have a, a wonderful uh, child life team here at this campus. They do wonders for us in clinic and make our job a whole lot easier. You may not have that luxury, uh, but you certainly can have some bubbles or some toys or some, you know, something you can use for distraction that can go a long way with these younger children. Our school age kids get down on their level. Don't, don't tower over them, be intimidating like that. It kind of helps to get down on their level. Uh, addressing the appropriate you know, terms and, and using appropriate word and terminology for, for kids based on their age is important. And then I imagine a lot of y'all's exams are like mine when I ask, okay, where does it hurt? And you get the shoulder or the, the back or, you know, something really global. Uh, I really like to start my exam with asking them to give me one finger in one spot. And if I can get them to do that, that usually gives me a good ballpark place to start. Uh, then I start with the contralateral side because that gives them a little comfort in what the exam is going to be. Uh, it also gives me a baseline normal for that patient. Uh, and then we move down to always checking that joint above and below or the bones and the joints above and below that injured extremity or that symptomatic extremity. Uh, be methodical and deliberate on your exam. All of us have gone through a skills lab at some point. Think back to those days, and they really taught you to go step by step in a systematic approach. It's really important when you're doing these exams because it keeps you from missing things. Uh, sometimes you'll see an x-ray, or you'll know kind of what you're walking into, and if you just kind of go on that and you don't go through those, that repetitive exam, a lot of times you may miss something subtle or something easy to miss, like this particular patient that has a uh, fourth metacarpal shaft fracture looks pretty benign, nothing too uh, significant about it. But if I just skipped through that exam, I would have missed that on the cascade, she actually has a little bit of a crossover here. She, she kind of crosses over that something we need to address that would have been really easy to miss if, if we hadn't gone through that exam. Another example of that's the seven-year-old male who fell off a scooter three days ago and came in complaining of wrist pain, a little bit of form and elbow pain, but primarily complaining of wrist pain the last three days. Got these x-rays and they're negative. What's that exam like? Well, let's take a look. So he's basically telling me, yep, it's the wrist that hurts. So I look at that contralateral side. I'm going to talk you guys through this since we can't hear it. Um, we'll flex it up, kind of go through rotation, come back down. And on the injured extremity, is this the wrist that hurts? That hurts? No, that doesn't hurt there. Okay. Now I'm going to ask him to try to make it look like the other side. I want to try to stretch it out and make it look like the other side. At this point, I kind of have a suspicion of what I think is going on with this child. So he can't really straighten it, so he kind of stops that, uh, that extension there, can't really extend it. So we're going to try to work on rotation. Does this hurt? Kind of rotation, palm down, yep, that hurts. How about palm up? Can we go palm up? Nope, that hurts, that hurts. Okay, now we're going to palpate. Uh, generally what I'm going to start with is kind of the posterior olecranon area. I'll squeeze that area, kind of work over the lateral, uh, lateral distal humerus area, or just kind of globally over the lateral aspect of the elbow. Then I'll move over the medial side. All of these have been a no so far. You can kind of see his body language. It will tell you in a minute where we're hurt. Distal humerus, nothing in that distal humerus. And now that last spot I'm going to go to is I'm going to trace down that radius proximally. I'm going to find that radial neck. I'm going to push over that radial neck. And you'll kind of see his response right there that, yeah, that, yeah, that hurts. Uh, so this is a, a pretty common presentation we see. It's one that's often missed. Um, when you have that triad of loss of terminal extension, they can't quite straighten that arm out. Uh, they have pain and guarding with forearm rotation and that focal tenderness over that radial neck. Think about a, uh, an occult radial neck fracture. You can see these were negative x-rays at presentation. But four weeks later, you can see that little bit of periosteal reaction where that fracture is actually healed. These kids will often come in with wrist pain or complaints of wrist pain. So uh, it can be a little bit distracting if you just kind of focus on the wrist. Um, kind of summing this section up, you know, uh, again, check the joints above and below. Uh, this patient on the left uh, is a, skip, a skiffy, a slipped capital femoral pyphsis. It, these kids are usually going to present with knee pain. They're going to come in with an insidious or a sudden onset of a limp and knee pain. Uh, if you just examine that knee, you, you kind of go to examine the knee, and oftentimes you'll find the knee is pretty normal. Uh, but you start to, to realize when you move up to the hip that they're, they're really limited and guarded there. Uh, this middle picture is, is an image where one is a fracture and the other is not. It's a little bit, if you don't read musculoskeletal films all day, in particular pediatric musculoskeletal films, 
A little challenging to look at that and know which is which. Uh, well, how will you tell? It's your exam. You've got to be able to trust your exam. You have to be able to default back to your exam. So which one's tender? Uh, which one's not? Um, same thing on this picture to the right. Uh, you know, don't be led astray by your radiology report. Those radiologists, uh, man, they're fantastic, but oftentimes they're sitting in a dark room and they're, they're looking at, at films, particularly pediatric films in our, in our case, that have a lot of variation. So I may take 10 kids and line them up all the same age. I may get three, four, five variations of what those images may look like based on that particular child's growth and development. So there's a lot of variation, and those radiologists are sitting up there without the patient to examine, uh, as well as without your notes oftentimes to be able to go off of. So they're just really needing to comment on anything that could be a little irregular. So correlate those findings. They should not contradict your exam findings. They should really correlate with what your exam's telling you. Number nine, don't miss a non-accidental trauma. Uh, these are the ones that keep us up at night. Nobody likes this. These are, are hard things that uh, make it a hard day and a long night a lot of times when you have one of these patients come through. But we have to remember that, that it's our obligation to, to advocate for these kids and protect these kids. Uh, it's out there. Uh, we need to know what to look for. Uh, it's estimated that just over 17,000 deaths in 2020 related to child abuse in the U.S. 60% of these had a previous history or clinical evidence of maltreatment. In the relationship with age, you know, kids under the age of one, up to 60% of fractures can be as, uh, associated with child abuse. Uh, red flags to think about, that inconsistent history, uh, multiple family members or multiple different en en enactments of what exactly happened. Uh, unwitnessed trauma in, in our young or nonverbal children. Uh, fracture that doesn't match the story, the two-month-old that, that rolled off the bed, that developmental history just doesn't add up. So those should be red flags for you and, and make you want to kind of investigate things a little bit more. Multiple fractures in various stages of healing is another one. You can look at these images and you can see uh, posterior rib fractures, which uh, used to be thought as, as kind of pathognomonic for uh, child abuse. Our metaphyseal corner fractures and our transphyseal fractures, uh, all of these are kind of red flags for us in, in the orthopedic world in particular. Risk factors in general, lower SES, unstable family situations. Uh, it's a higher presence with non-biological caregiver in the home. Family stressors, uh, which makes sense, are financial, domestic violence, alcohol and drug abuse, psychiatric history. Uh, and then children with uh, chronic, chronic medical conditions also at risk. So. Uh, be alert to those. Know what your resources and your obligations are. In North Texas, we're lucky to have a, a program called the REACH program at Children's at CMC Dallas that we utilize quite a bit. Uh, it's a great resource to have, and, and if you aren't familiar with it, uh, it's certainly one that, that you probably should become familiar with. Uh, X-ray views matter. Uh, this can be going on, this can go in a lot, a lot of different ways. We're going to start with this. It's, it's 10 o'clock, and you guys close at, let's say, 11 o'clock. You're, you're busy. This kid walks in. You see that little bit of clinical deformity there in the wrist. In your head, you're trying to decide, well, I'm trying to get my staff out of here at 11. You're working the urgent care. You guys are about to close. You're, you're trying to get out the door, um, but you don't know what to do with this particular kid. Uh, so if you are uh, lucky enough to have a good resource, which I'd encourage you all to have a good referral resource, wherever you're practicing, those, those of you online uh, that may not be local, find whoever you send your pediatric orthopedic patients to build that relationship. Uh, it's helpful to be able to reach out to them, and, and it's pretty easy to do in today's era. So... Uh, if you had that person and you got them on the phone and you said, hey, I've got this kid, I just need to know if I need to send them to an ER, or if this is something I could splint and send you tomorrow, or whatever that conversation may be, how would you describe this? So I'll let everybody think about that for a minute, how they'd want to describe this. Really just giving you a couple seconds, but uh, nonetheless, you know, we like to use very specific terms in orthopedics. Uh, it's kind of its own language. We like to use terminology like closed versus open. So if there is a, a pinhole, uh, abrasion, a cut, anything bleeding, anything near that fracture. Well, that needs to be presumed to be an open fracture until we can prove it's not. That's a really important thing to be alert and, and kind of watch for. Uh, proximal versus distal. So proximal towards midline, distal away from midline. Angulation, we, we talk about that in terms of the apex, which direction does the fracture point. So apex volar uh, on the volar aspect here, or apex dorsal. Shortening where there's overlapping of the fracture patterns. Displaced versus non-displaced, intra-articular and extra-articular. So for this particular injury, if you were to say, I've got a distal radius and ulna fracture that's got apex volar angulation, I would tell you that's, that's a home run. If you really wanted to maybe add in, it's got 50 degrees of apex volar angulation, that'd be even better. But it gives me a really good idea of what we're looking at on the other end of the phone. Uh, it makes it a lot easier for me to kind of comfortably and confidently tell you what, what I feel like you could do with that particular patient. What about when you get this view? A little bit more challenging, right? Um, you can tell the hand's positioned a little bit different, so they tried to get two different views, but essentially we have one of the same view. Neither of them are an AP, neither of them are, are a lateral. This is something we get multiple times daily in clinic where we have kind of these images, and I get it, it's hard to get an x-ray on a patient that's uncomfortable, um, but it's extremely important that you as a provider, when these are your tools to make a diagnosis, that you advocate to get good, proper images. 
Um, you're not helping anybody if we get really poor images and that patient goes from your clinic to the next clinic and, and or to us in the clinic and needs to get new x-rays because we can't really determine what we need to do. This is not really that case, uh, but it, it happens a lot. So uh, please, whoever's taking your, your images, uh, spend time with them. If you're not getting proper or adequate images, uh, spend the time to, to kind of make that better, improve that process because it really helps the patients not get repeat images, repeat exposure, the expense, all of those things. You can see how much better these images are with just a good lateral and a good AP. It gives everybody a really easy description or way to describe this. Also gives you the ability to know what you're going to do to manage this fracture. Another example of that is this one here, a little bit better lateral, a little bit better AP perhaps, uh, but just with a little better positioning. Man, this thing's almost anatomically aligned. This is without doing anything to the arm. It's just better positioning for the, for the x-ray. It can make a huge difference. X-rays can, can make your images look better or worse based on how you, uh, you, you take them. Another good example is this uh, elbow on the left that was transferred via ambulance uh, from a tertiary care uh, small ER out in West Texas to the trauma center for an elbow dislocation. They got to the trauma center after a few hours of uh, transport, uh, waiting. Uh, they get repeat x-rays after the splint's taken off, and we can see that they do have an elbow joint effusion, but they certainly do not have an elbow dislocation. Uh, so poor images can lead to a, a bad diagnosis and, and a long day and expense for the families. Not all fractures require a cast. Uh, it's, it's hard for parents to grasp this sometimes. I find that it's, it's hard even for, for medical folks or, or healthcare providers to grasp that sometimes. But we see a lot of things in pediatrics that for one reason or another, we do not cast them. That, that's on purpose, that's intentional. It's not because we didn't want to do a cast or we ran out of material, it's because that didn't need a cast. It does better without a cast in most instances. So our clavicle fractures, our proximal humerus fractures, radial neck, these are all injuries that we generally use a sling or we treat with some other form of immobilization. This middle picture here is a uh, buckle fracture. Uh, the buckle fracture is one we see a lot of that we treat with these volar splints. Our proximal phalanx fractures will usually get this finger splint or buddy tape. We do a lot of buddy tape. And uh, I think one of the things to, to know is that just because you see a patient that has buddy tape or a splint or a brace or a sling on, doesn't mean they don't have a real injury. Uh, I think a lot of times families come in and they're, they're kind of disappointed they're not getting cast at times because uh, they feel like it doesn't sig signal it. Johnny's really hurt or Johnny has something going on. Well, that's not the case. So make sure you spend the time to educate these families of why you're putting them in the buddy tape or the finger splint or the brace or the sling and get them to understand that they, that they don't really need more immobilization. It's not really uh, great for some of these injuries to be immobilized and not be able to move. Uh, our toddler's fractures, these are stable injuries. Uh, Tons of literature out there that, that kind of show us these do well with just a boot for immobilization. So this kid can avoid a cast. Uh, likely also will avoid things like this where we sometimes can make the, uh, the treatment worse than the injury itself. We're managing these ulcerations or these um, uh, skin irritation areas from uh, the splints or the cast that they were put in way longer than we are these fractures. And it's just something that's unnecessary. Number six, splints and cast are not benign. That kind of transitions really well to this section. It's always a fun section. Uh, you know, it's important that when you're going to put on a cast or put on a splint, you understand what, uh, what you're doing, how you're doing it, what material you use. Uh, all of these, are, or several of these, are a result of not having enough padding on a young child that was put in a splint. Uh, sometimes it's the plaster splint. A lot, of, a lot of you guys are using the prefab stuff now, which does have a little bit more protection from this. But these things release an exothermic reaction, and so burns happen when there's not a barrier to the skin. Uh, you you want to really make a family upset. You, you have a broken arm they're stressed about, and you bring them in, now they've got a broken arm in this when uh, we take the splint off, and, and that's a real big problem for these families and, and for the kid, obviously. Um, the one up here on the top right is just an elastic band that was a little bit tight with the ACE wrap. So make sure you know you have a swollen extremity. If it's an acute injury, it's likely to swell more. Uh, you don't want to put something on there that has no room to, to kind of give and expand a little bit. Educate your patients. They need to understand what to do and what they can't do and what to happen if they do something wrong. Uh, the picture on the left is a patient that got wet. The cast gets wet or the splint gets wet. It can't stay on. Uh, it's not something you can wait 10 days, 15 days to go back to the clinic and, and get evaluated because now it smells and there's a foul odor coming out of it. Uh, this, this leads to a lot of problems. So if it gets wet, they need to understand it needs to be taken off. It needs to be taken off by a healthcare professional. Once you take a splint off, you're not going to be able to reapply that splint without having it redone. It's just not going to fit the same. And that's usually going to result in you having some kind of a bony prominence or something rubbing or some kind of skin irritation. The middle picture is the classic coat hanger. Uh, that, that's probably, you know, growing up, anybody that had a cast is probably something you did. Uh, educate your families not to use this. Uh, there are things that you can purchase online now. They're, ad, they're advertised, literally advertised to be a cast scratcher. And we really think that's a bad idea. We really want to steer families away from putting anything in the cast. 
Uh, the one on the right, these are our magic tricks. Um, so you go in with a marker and a cap, and you come out with a marker and no cap. Uh, this particular kid was 12 years old. He knew better. He knew it was in there, but he also knew he was told not to put any, anything in there. So he didn't tell his family for three and a half weeks till they come, come in to get the cast off. And you can see the result of that. Um, this one, a little bit longer. I don't know exactly how long this one was in there, but this is a pretty common one. So point being, don't put anything in your cast to scratch. If something gets stuck in there, they need to know, hey, it's okay. Things happen. Get somewhere and get it taken out because it can be a problem. So again, in summary on that, uh, remember that cast and splints aren't benign. Anybody that applies these, whoever puts this on at your facility needs to, to really understand what they're doing. They need to have the proper training. They need to be trained with the material you're going to use at your facility. Uh, it doesn't necessarily help them to learn how to put a splint on with something that they're not going to be able to use. The prefab material we mentioned is really good. It does have some bears. It's, it's created um, to def definitely expedite things. It speeds things up and uh, you can get these splints on a little bit quicker, but in our pediatric patients, we still advocate for some extra padding around the bony prominences. Um, you know, they're, the barrier when you're putting these splints on are super important. Uh, elevation, again, you have a, a swollen extremity and an acute injury. It's likely to continue to swell. Elevation's important, but make sure they're not resting anything behind the heel. It needs to be hanging off. That's a really important fact. That's why we see a lot of these heel blisters or ulcerations is because they go home warm, sweaty, uh, swollen extremity. They prop it up and they sit there for the next two days elevating and they come back in and they have those big blisters or big ulcerations in the back of the heel that, that certainly are problematic. So elevation, don't put anything inside of it. Uh, if you have to take it off, it needs to be reapplied by a medical professional. Um, more or less, the, the key being know what you're doing, putting it on, know how to educate these families to take care of the splint or this cast safely. Pediatric fracture patterns. You know, kids' bones are very different than adult bones. It's less dense and more porous. It has increased elasticity. They tend to break in patterns. Um, the thick periosteum kind of aids in, in some of that pattern as well. Uh, that's kind of this analogy, the, the twig with the uh, bark that stays hinged on one side. So we get these green stick, these torus uh, buckle fractures, or plastic deformation. So we can get complete fractures in our pediatric patients. It's not that it doesn't happen. They're just a little bit less common. They're usually a result of a higher energy mechanism uh, and often grossly displaced and a little bit less stable, um, a little bit more challenging in treating some of these. Uh, our incomplete fractures is what we really think about when we think about our pediatric fractures. Uh, you, you take that increased elasticity and it gives the bone the ability to kind of be squished or axial load through it and it bends before it breaks. So we get that plastic deformation is what we call this. Or these torus buckle fractures where it just gives on one cortex, the rest of the bone's fine. And then that classic green stick fracture where that periosteum stays, uh, stays hinged or intact. And that certainly can help us with stability. It aids us in fractures uh, with reductions. Sometimes it can hinder us with reductions as well. And then our physeal fractures. This is really an important part of pediatric orthopedics. It's something we spend a lot of time learning and understanding when you uh, work in this, in this field. Um, it's something we absolutely must understand because it can have a really bad uh, outcome or a poor sequela if you fail to recognize which ones of these can be problems for you. The good news is, unless that's what you do, you don't really need to know all that. I would advocate that you don't need to know uh, the one through five classification. You don't need to really identify that part of it. What you need to know is that there's a growth plate, there's a physis, and that if there's a fracture near that physis or in that physis that concerns you or it looks like it involves the physis, well, we, we want to be a little more prompt with our referral with those. Part of the reason is because once you get past day five to seven, somewhere in there, we, we start to really have to, to pause and think if this thing comes in displaced, uh, do we need to reduce it? We have to kind of weigh the, the risks and benefits of reducing them when they come in later because essentially you're creating a secondary uh, injury to that physis or that growth plate, which can result in, in damage and, and increase that likelihood of having a growth disturbance. Um, very few of these go on to really be a significant functional disturbance, but nonetheless, the ones that do are really, really um, devastating for, for some of these patients. So uh, the message here would be don't get so caught up in identifying unless you're just uh, really wanting to know these classifications. Don't worry about the classification so much. Just be able to identify when you see one of these and, and know that you need to get it immobilized and get into to see us. It's not an emergency, but it's not something we want to sit on for a week or four or five days. It's something we want to get in you know, pretty promptly. Number four, most pediatric fractures can be managed non-operatively. This is the beauty of our clinic and, and what we, uh, we all really, really do. Uh, we have a fantastic team, like Dr. Ellis said. Uh, we work really efficiently together. Uh, we have a lot of experience uh, with our, our team. And the, the beauty of what we do are these kids get better. Um, kids tend to get better uh, pretty quickly. Most of these fractures do really, really well. Uh, we're going to go through a couple examples. This is Owen. He's a nine-year-old male, a displaced distal radius and ulna fractures. He was sent to a local ER, later seen by an outside orthopedic surgeon, was taken to the OR for CRPP, closed reduction, percutaneous pinning, um, and placed into a long-arm cast for six weeks. 
presented to Scottish Rite about nine weeks later because the family was a little concerned about what the post-op x-rays look like. Here are our post-op x-rays, our, our two-week out post-op x-rays. Here we are at nine weeks when they presented to us, okay? So yeah, I can see as a parent why that's a, a bit alarming. It doesn't look a whole lot different than it did initially. Uh, but despite this, uh, this surgery, uh, the scar, the risk of anesthesia, all of those things that go into this, this fracture healed, remodeled, and you can see a year later, you really can't tell much about where that fracture was. Um, so the biology of these kids is pretty amazing. The ability for the body to heal these, especially in these younger children, uh, is, is really remarkable. We're going to look at a similar case. This is a 12-year-old, so a little bit older, and that, that plays a role in this, right? Um, we'll talk about why a little bit later, but this is a 12-year-old who fell at hockey practice, seen a local urgent care splinted, came in to walk in the next day, had this distal radius and ulnar fractures that are grossly displaced and shortened. Uh, this is a family I knew. I'd treated them before already. They had a lot of trust in our clinic. Um, really um, great family and, and a really good kid, pretty tough kid. He came in and we kind of talked about what the options are. We, we talked about the APU, which is a procedure unit that we can go in and, and give some sedation and do this under conscious sedation. Usually we have to schedule that maybe the next day or a day or two uh, different, sometimes the same day when it's available. Or we can do this with a hematoma block and some oral pain medications in clinic. Uh, this particular kid decided, hey, you know, I, I think we can do this. The family was okay. So after we discussed the kind of risk and benefits and pros and cons of each, they elected to go ahead and move forward with the hematoma block. So for those of you that haven't seen a hematoma block, this is a hematoma block. I don't know if the, yeah, we have volume, I think. Maybe not. So you'll see the flash coming through here. We're going to put that lidocaine directly into that fracture site, into that hematoma. After we get the hematoma block in, we usually have a, a cast tech or uh, somebody kind of help hold traction. We'll just kind of hold tr axial traction. That helps us to uh, kind of stretch out those muscles, get things relaxed a little bit, lets that block set up a little bit. Uh, this is a time that I'll usually step out with the family and I'll tell the parents uh, exactly what they're going to see because if not, um, two things I worry about. One, I worry about having two patients where the family falls over and now we have to get them taken care of as well. Uh, the second thing I worry about is that they may grab their phone and call CPS and, and uh, have them come in for me. Uh, so they need to understand that what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, I was taught to, to kind of use counter traction through, or, um, through my, my leg, and that's the technique I use, and it looks a little bit barbaric, but it, it tends to work for me, and that's what I like to use. So I want the family to understand exactly what they're going to see first. So we'll see kind of how he does with this uh, closed reduction. This is pre-child life, by the way. This is an older video. We did not have child life here yet. Uh, so this iPad was uh, subbing, and, and man, what a difference child life has made. Uh, so let's see how he does. So I'm asking him how he feels. I'll kind of glide through here and press through there, kind of milk that a little bit. He's telling me, I don't feel anything. I feel good. It's, it's a lot more convincing when you can actually hear him. Sorry. Um, but, but that's what he's saying, I promise. Um, he's, he does have a, a little bit of uh, oral pain medication on, on board as well, which certainly helps to aid with this and, and relaxation. You're finding that fracture pattern. You're putting your, your thumb kind of right behind it, and you're going to try to just go back up and over. You've got to unhinge that periosteum, so you really have to give it a good up and over. So we can see he did pretty well. We'll move on to the images. You can see his post-reduction images. Not perfect, not anatomic, but it's acceptable. Uh, that's an important concept to think of. We don't have to have these perfect. Uh, we can see at six weeks how he looked, and then again at 14 weeks. So not all that different than the, the previous case, right? A little bit older patient, uh, different, different way to go about it. Uh, Big difference, like I said, needs to be acceptable, not anatomic. Uh, this helps us to avoid unnecessary procedures. Uh, the parameter is based on the fracture location, the age of the patient. Those, those kind of things are important for us to think about in orthopedics to know which ones we can manage without taking them to the OR and then trying to prevent these unnecessary procedures. Uh, the cost of a reduction in the ER versus, or the clinic versus the OR is often two to four times higher. Some literature would even suggest more, uh, but with similar outcomes, less risk and no scars. Uh, this is a great example. We just showed those two cases that are, are very different the way they were managed. This is a study at a JPO in 2019 that talks about a closed reduction in the ER clinic setting versus the CRPP or procedure in the OR, a little over double the cost. Um, so not that that needs to dictate the care, but it, it certainly should weigh in the decision making for the families. It's, it, it's fair to give the family both options or all the options. I think it's important that we do that um, and, and go through those things with the families as well. Another case, this is a 10-year-old female. 
uh, sustained this both bone forearm shaft fracture that's often short, came into the clinic late in the day, a little bit unprepared. We didn't expect this patient to show up. They just showed up from the coach. Um, they came in, the, you know, that hematoma, that trick doesn't really work so well on the forearm. Uh, so this is one that's a little bit harder to do. It's something we generally are going to want uh, conscious sedation with or a little bit more sedation or anesthesia involved with. So we, we splinted them and posted them for the APU the following morning. For any of you guys that have never seen a closed reduction, uh, I definitely accentuate this one a little bit, um, maybe more than we need to. But the point being, we have to get these things out to length. And sometimes, again, it looks a little bit barbaric to do so. Uh, if you're a little squeamish or um, had a lot to eat and not feeling real comfortable, you may want to look away for this one. Uh, we can see that clinical deformity. Again, uh, these things reduce quite nicely, but sometimes you have to unhinge that periosteum. We talked about how it can be helpful and how it can sometimes hinder us. So we want to pull this fracture back into that plane of deformity and kind of unhinge that and then pull it back up and over. These are rotational injuries, so sometimes you have to, uh, if, if the ulna is intact, sometimes you have to break through that ulna to be able to get the radius to reduce as well. Again, results look, look really good. Uh, the family may look at this and think, ah, man, I don't know that that looks really good to me. But that's why you spend so much time early on explaining to them what the uh, outcome should look like, what your ex expectations are. You really set those up before you do this so the next time they see this image, they're kind of on the same page as to what you're anticipating. Uh, case number four, this is a humeral shaft fracture. It's a really ugly one. These are almost always ugly like this. This is a really tough conversations with families, but fortunately this bone does really, really well. Uh, these tend to heal. They're very forgiving. The parameters of what's acceptable uh, are, are really uh, generous. So 20 degrees of anterior angulation, 30 degrees of varus or valgus angulation, and three centimeters of shortening. Those are kind of our goals. Um, there's a couple of different ways to manage these. In, in my practice, I like to use the long arm hanging cast. I feel like one, I feel like my patients tolerate it well. They, they seem to be a little more comfortable uh, early on at least. I also feel like that traction, if it's done right and done correctly in a compliant patient, uh, it tends to give some assistance in reducing this. Uh, you can just use a humeral cuff. Some people will go to a humeral cuff with these fractures. I generally will cast for the first couple of weeks and then I'll switch them over to a humeral cuff. You can see this patient at presentation one week later in that long arm hanging cast. Uh, long arm hanging cast is essentially a really heavy weighted cast down in the elbow. Uh, you use the loop that's down on the distal end of the cast to position it to kind of help you control some of the angulation and some of that deformity. And then the, the point or the key to those are that that patient goes home and they're dependent. They let this arm hang down so gravity is able to work. Um, so you try to really educate them on, on positioning in that position as much as, as often as possible. Number three, uh, pediatric bone remodel remodeling is remarkable. Uh, again, this is another great part of, of what we do every day and conversations we enjoy with our families. Uh, they're challenging, but, but it's, it's, it's just really cool to, to see this. To be quite honest, the biology of these kids is, is pretty amazing. So understanding those other things we talked about before, but we really skipped over the basic principles of remodeling because I knew we'd get to it now. Uh, the younger the age, the proximity of the physis and the activity of the adjacent physis, these are all things that uh, increase or give greater potential to remodel. Um, sometimes these injuries like this femoral shaft fracture that maybe is less than ideal will present. Perhaps this kid was uh, uh, unstable for surgery and, and for whatever reason had to heal this direction or in this position rather. Uh, they also had this tib-fib down here distally. Uh, they, they present to us for follow-up with this thing already healed, but we can just watch it over time and we can see if this remodels. And lo and behold, in this kid, it remodeled really nicely. Uh, there's no further intervention. That's just the body and the biology taking over and doing this for us. Uh, another good example is the proximal humerus. This fracture in particular can have some controversy. There are some people that prefer to fix this. Uh, again, I like the hanging long arm cast. Give this a chance uh, to reduce a little bit. Uh, generally, these will heal. It's really close to that physis. Um, this is a high remodeling potential in this area. And we can often avoid those uh, surgical risks that, that are associated. You know, surgery in general is very safe, but that risk is not zero. As uh, one of our partners said a couple weeks ago in a lecture, I, I like that. Uh, the risk is not zero. We can't make it zero. So uh, when we can avoid a surgery, I think that's worth trying to do. Another good example, this is the ice cream and the cone. So here's our ice cream, here's our cone. Something's not right there. It looks like my toddler was eating that. We can see a year later how that's really well aligned. That remodeling's occurred. It, it's done fantastic. Again, high, high remodeling potential up here around that proximal humerus in younger children. Uh, this is a humeral shaft fracture in a really young child. You can see at eight weeks, we look pretty good. At eight months, you almost can't see it anymore. Uh, pretty remarkable. 
Clavicle fractures. Um, again, these were modeled really well in, in pediatric patients. I, I put a little snippet of our, uh, this is a fact study that was a Boston uh, Harvard-led study that had eight large pediatric institutions that worked on. We were one of them. Um, this is a, a really large study that kind of looked and, and tried to help define which ones of these clavicle fractures that come in that are almost always ugly and completely displaced and really anxious families, which ones do we need to be aggressive and treat in the OR? And by and large, what we found is that uh, not many, if, if any, need to be, to be treated in the operating room. Uh, these things do really, really well. They remodel really well, and outcomes are not uh, different um, uh, from operative versus non-operative care with these. There are a few, uh, there are a few of those that, that that doesn't hold true for, but by and large, pediatric or adolescent clavicle fractures do really well with non-operative care. Uh, another situation like that are these overriding distal radius and ulna fractures. Um, this is a pretty hot topic in orthopedics right now and has been for probably the last five plus years. Uh, there's lots of evidence that we can manage these fractures without reducing them, uh, where we can put this into a cast and control for the angulation, the position, and keep them within the parameters that are acceptable and let these things heal and remodel over time, uh, particularly in kids that are less than 12 years old. Uh, the older we are, the closer we are to skull maturity, that trick doesn't really work so well. It's a conversation that we have pretty frequently with families. We'll, we'll give them the information. We'll go through some of these studies with them. We'll show them images and kind of talk to them about this uh, and let them make the decision. Do they want us to do that, that hematoma block and that closed reduction with this fracture, or is this one that they want to try to just let heal as it is? Um, but by and large, these things do really, really well. Not all fractures are an emergency. We're going to say that again. Not all fractures are an emergency. Um, these all do not need to go to the emergency room. Our emergency rooms are busy enough as it is. And uh, boy, those, those folks or any of you guys that work in the ER probably really appreciate us not sending every fracture, every buckle fracture, or anything like that into the ER. So uh, one of our colleagues up in Delaware at Nemours uh, did a study that presented at, at PAUSA this year uh, with a retrospective review of 250 ortho ED transfers. Um, showed that almost 40% did not need to go to the emergency room. Uh, nine hours, average of nine hours total time spent for these patients, 3,000 ambulance charges through transfers for these patients or that was the average. And then uh, to, to help that, they formed a multidisciplinary team to kind of work on utilize, utilizing telemedicine to help improve that process. Uh, I think this is a really good example that he gave. This is a medial epicondyle that was likely associated with an elbow dislocation. If you've seen one of these before, this is a pretty swollen extremity. Uh, this is uh, urgent care out in a rural community. Saw this patient with this big swollen elbow, was not dislocated, uh, was at that point was back in, in place and reduced, but did have this fracture and was pretty swollen. But they didn't feel comfortable with it, so they wanted to send it to a, a different urgent care that had a little bit more of the ER slash urgent care approach to it. Uh, they sent them to urgent care number two via ambulance. They got there, the splint was taken off, the arm was examined. They didn't really feel comfortable with it. This is, uh, I think this kid was maybe 14, 16, somewhere 14, 16, somewhere in there, probably closer to 16 looking at this. They didn't really feel comfortable with it, decided they wanted to transfer it to an ER, another transfer to an emergency room now, so they went back into the city to a bigger ER. That ER was an adult facility, didn't really have peds, and they wanted to send them somewhere they had some peds and, and some more resources, so they transferred them again. So that's one, two, three, four different emergency rooms before that patient was, for the fourth time, taken out of their splint, placed back into their splint, uh, and then discharged home to follow up with orthopedics. Uh, so this is a great example of how we, we need to better utilize these resources. Uh, earlier in the talk, I mentioned that if you guys are practicing or you're new to a practice or new to an area, uh, how valuable it is for you to, to build contacts and network, right? We live in an area where it's super easy to network. Pick up the phone, text somebody, call somebody, uh, find that orthopedic resource that you have and reach out to them wherever you're at build that relationship so you can shoot a text over to somebody and say, hey, this is what I have. Can I run it by you real quick? And it'll save these families and these patients uh, a lot of undue stress and, and money and time. So office management of fractures, keep it simple. We talked about the good history and exam, appropriate x-ray views, making sure we're getting good orthogonal views, uh, immobilization options, know what you have available, know how to apply them safely, uh, know how to discuss pain control, warning signs, elevation, those kind of things with the family. Uh, it's helpful for you to establish a relationship with the referral resources. Again, that's the third time I've said it because I really feel that passionately about it. I think it's extremely important for that relationship to be built. Uh, determine the timeline for referrals. So we have those uh, kind of minor dinks here and there, non-displaced fractures that uh, 24, 72 hours is fine. Maybe those mild to moderately displaced fractures uh, that you can immobilize. You have a trustworthy family you can refer out and they can come in 24, 72 hours. Your semi-urgent referral, uh, that's usually within that 24, 48 hour period. So this is something a little bit more uh, displaced, something you're a little concerned about. Um, maybe warrants a phone call just to kind of justify, is it okay? Or, or kind of reassure yourself and the family that it's okay for that to wait. And that emergency one, those are the ones that are a little bit more obvious, uh, but rather than go through each one of those, it's probably a little easier to talk about what can't wait. So 
Orthopedic emergencies, non-inclusive, um, open fractures, neurovascular concerns, or severe swelling, severe clinical deformity, that skiffy we mentioned earlier, uh, femur fractures and pain uncontrolled with, with oral pain medications. Outside of these, really, in, in pediatrics especially, most, most fractures can be a safely immobilized, good elevation, good pain control, a reasonable family, and they usually are fine to wait for 24, 72 hours to be seen by orthopedics. All right, drum roll for number one. You're treating the, the parent and the patient. This is important for us to all remember, and anybody that treats pediatric patients understands this well. Uh, it's not easy, you know, especially in a stressful and in challenging time when the family come in. Um, I've done this talk before, and this used to be number 10, and, and over time I've realized, man, I probably should bump that up to number one, because that's probably the most challenging thing we do and deal with on a, a daily basis. There's a lot of psychology in what goes into uh, to our clinic. When these patients come in, these families come in, and you have a fracture like this, and you're telling them it's going to heal and be fine, and we're really not going to do anything to it. Um, I found that if you spend an extra five or 10 minutes up front, you're, you're often going to save yourself 25 or 30 minutes on the back end on subsequent visits. It's extremely important to lay out those expectations in a really clear, well-defined manner where the family understands what the next time they see that image, what you expect it to look like. I don't expect this to come back and look normal again when you come back and see me in four or five weeks, but it's going to look like this. And, and perhaps you show them some examples. Uh, a lot of things in pediatric orthopedics are abstract, right? So it's not, uh, you can't always look at an image in, like this one and say, well, there, clearly see that fracture. Anybody can see that, right? Sometimes you're going to have these occult fractures or what we call hidden fractures. You can't really pick up on the x-ray and uh, you're having to convince that family that fracture is there, even though you can't point to a fracture and show them. Uh, the osteochondral injuries or, or puff seal or fice seal fractures, same kind of deal. So we come up with a lot of different analogies or ways to kind of relate to these families. Uh, some of them are a little bit silly and, and maybe uh, you look at them and think, I don't know if I could really make that work. But, but I'll tell you, all of these are ones I probably use daily that I feel like if nothing else, it, it, it makes the family feel a little bit more comforted or reassured that we're talking about a, some, something they understand or at least can kind of grasp some of that concept. Uh, we put these remodeling posters up in our rooms. Every room we have in the fracture clinic has one. Uh, we use that really, really uh, frequently. This book is another one we use that came out, has a lot of examples of remodeling and particular injuries broken down by the extremity and, and kind of marched out through days, weeks, months, as well as different age groups, uh, tools we like to use to kind of get these, drive these points home and, and get these families comfortable with the plan. Um, the fracture you can't see, if you've been doing this for any length of time and you're, you're treating these patients, particularly in the ER and urgent care settings, you're going to see this report. No obvious fracture, but an elbow joint effusion is noted with a positive posterior fat pad. Well, uh, what does that mean? If you don't really know what that means, then how are you going to explain to the family what that means? Uh, what it should mean to you is that in the face of trauma, if this patient came in with a traumatic injury uh, and they have that posterior fat pad with a negative, otherwise negative x-ray and they have a symptomatic elbow exam, well, then there's a fracture somewhere. Um, and, and your job is, is to identify there is a fracture. Maybe if you're not doing orthopedics, it's not your job to exactly know which one it is, but to identify there is a fracture there and that, that patient needs to be splinted and referred. Uh, what we know in orthopedics is that uh, what, these, what causes this or what this fat pad you see right here, the posterior fat pad and the anterior fat pad or what we call the cell sign in this particular case, uh, what causes that is that we have uh, the fat pads that lay right next to the distal humerus, one anteriorly here and the back one in the olecranon fossa. Those usually, on a normal x-ray, you will not see the posterior fat pad. It's not there. Uh, the anterior fat pad, sometimes you can see it. It just kind of lays flat next to the bone, right? It doesn't really come out to a point like this one here. So when a fracture occurs, the capsule fills up with blood. It, it pushes those fat pads up off the bone, and that's what's projecting on the x-ray image. So that's what you're seeing. You're seeing that cell sign on the anterior fat pad, and that posterior fat pad that should not be visible is visible. So uh, keep in mind, anytime you see the posterior one, that's a problem. If you see the anterior one and it's coming out to a point in a cell, well, that's probably a joint effusion. If it's just kind of laying flat, that may just be normal, uh, the normal fat pad that's there. But when you see these, recognize that it is a fracture, splint these and refer these in the face of trauma. Uh, I, I think images like this, I have this saved where I can pull this up really quick and explain this to a family because this is such a common injury we see and it's just a lot easier for me to give them something to be able to look at and, and kind of explain just what we just talked about. Uh, kind of helps them understand I'm, I'm not making this up. Um, another one we deal with a lot is the uh, the kid that falls on the wrist, ha comes in with focal tenderness over the distal radius around the level of the physis with the negative x-ray. Uh, you look at that x-ray again, 10 kids all the same age, line them up with no injuries, you're going to get a good variation of maybe three, four, five of those kids uh, that are normal, quote unquote, for that 10-year-old or whatever age that patient is, but there may be a big variation in, in that. 
Um, so in this particular kid, relatively normal x-ray, you could argue there might be a little widening here. Uh, so after finding the, the history, knowing they fell into that outstretched arm, knowing that they're tender over that distal radius physis and they have that soft tissue swelling, I'm probably going to call this a, a physeal fracture. To explain that to the family, sometimes I use this analogy of the Oreo cookie. If you think about an Oreo cookie in the room and you have that cookie in your hand and there's a crack in the top cookie or the bottom cookie, that's really easy to see. But if there's just a little fissure in that cream or there's a little shift in that cream, you can't really see that all that well just staring at the cookie. Same thing with the x-ray. If there's a crack in the epiphysis or the bone up here or the bone down here in the metaphysis, those are usually easy to see. But if it just involves this kind of cartilage zone through here, you're not always going to see a fracture. You may see a little bit of a slide or um, like this. Uh, this distal fibula you can see is slid over a little bit or translated over. You may see a little bit of widening. So it's not always a crack we're looking for. I think that analogy kind of helps them sometimes. And then our torus buccal fractures, uh, the, the Coke can, I like to tell them, you know, this is a, a small wrinkle in the bone. Uh, it's not dangerous, which is the reason we're going to treat this with a volar splint rather than an expensive cast. Um, and I explain it like taking a Coke can that's empty, you squish it a little bit, and it just gets a little crinkle or a little wrinkle on one side. The rest of the can is fine. This thing's inherently stable. It's going to do great. Uh, I, do, I do feel like that gives them a little bit of uh, comfort kind of talking about it in those terms. Uh, point being, you have to find ways to relate to these families. If that family leaves your office and they don't feel comfortable with your plan of care, you have lost. Um, that was a fail for, for your visit that day. And I would, I would tell you the majority of second opinions we see come see us is not because they're seeking a different treatment plan. They're really just seeking clarity. They want to understand why the treatment plan is what it is. And uh, whoever saw them first maybe didn't do such a great job of explaining that. So um, we, we spend a lot of times with the families trying to make them comfortable. And that's really all I have. So I appreciate you guys uh, paying attention and uh, tuning in. And I hopefully you have some questions. That's a good question, and I think questions like that are certainly, uh, to some degree, often circumstantial. Um, you may practice somewhere in a rural community. You may not have the resources around you, so there's a lot of things or vari variations of, the, of that scenario. Um, I would tell you, going back to, to your previous point, again, that referral resource, that uh, be able to reach out to the orthopedic team and saying, hey, what would you prefer I did with this is certainly maybe, in my opinion, the best option. Um, other than that, I would tell you that if you guys have something you see that you feel like needs advanced imaging, in, in my opinion and in our area, I would prefer you send that into us and let us kind of evaluate that kid uh, for a lot of different reasons. Sometimes we want very specific exams. Sometimes we need contrast. We don't need contrast. There's, there's certain series we may or sequences we may be looking for that uh, we, we may perhaps be a little bit better at um, uh, knowing what exactly we're going to want and rather than have that patient get an exam and need a second exam or us to have to make decisions based off of a exam that gives us less information than we prefer. Uh, it's a lot easier for the families, a lot, a lot more cost efficient for us to just um, kind of be the one making that decision. So I would advocate one, reach out to that referral provider, ask them what exactly they want or uh, send them in and let us kind of make that decision. That'd kind of be my approach to it. I don't think that's, no, I don't think that's a good idea. I think in general, uh, one, if you don't do these all the time, you, you know, me, myself, a, a big needle phobe, I don't like injections. Most kids don't either. Um, yeah, I'm a big baby about it. I get it. Our, our clinic staff likes to make fun of me, but they're not comfortable. Kids don't like them, right? And so if you take that tool from us the first time, and then I've got to pitch that a second time when they come into their reduction, that's going to make it a big challenge to begin with. Uh, but I think in general, most of these kids, especially with that fracture you just described, they're going to do fantastic. If you put them in a splint, you teach them how to elevate, you send them home all alternating Tylenol and Motrin with appropriate doses and timing, uh, those kids will do well. I think if you ask 10 people that, that do uh, what we do, you're probably going to get six different answers. Um, in my hands, when I see a buckle fracture like the one we showed earlier, uh, I'm going to put that in a, a volar splint, a little removable brace. I'm going to ask the family to wear that brace pre, pretty much all the time unless they're bathing over the next three weeks and ask them to stop wearing it around the three weeks. Sometimes depending on the kid or the fracture, um, if it's a little bit more of a buckle or if I really don't trust the kid or the family, then sometimes I'll tell them let's wear that thing for four weeks. But somewhere between that third and fourth week, I'm going to ask them to stop wearing the brace and I'm going to ask them to uh, let little Johnny start using his arm normally again and moving it normally again, but keep them off the monkey bars, off the playground, all those things for one more week. Um, so that fourth week, if there's any symptoms left, if they can't press all over that wrist, Johnny can't move that wrist normally, there's anything that concerns them, to call us. And I'm going to bring them back in to see me and we can kind of reevaluate if we need to. That 
maybe happens once a year, and we treat hundreds and hundreds of these. It almost never happens. Um, I find that if we tell these families two weeks, take it off, which is, is very reasonable in some, some places that, that may be the approach, I'm likely to get a call around that two and a half week mark or three week mark because sometimes those symptoms linger. So I stretch it out a little bit, which is, um, again, circumstantial. You have to kind of feel the family out, what their goals are. Um, but in general, I find these things do really, really well. They very seldom need uh, follow-up care or repeat imaging. Man, that's a, there, there's a lot of rabbit holes to go down on, the, on that particular answer. It really depends on the, the patient, the family, the fracture. Uh, it's so dependent upon what the injury was. Um, we generally, you know, we, we have a pretty good understanding of what the bone healing time is. We can get a pretty good understanding on that usually and give those families early on. Like I said, we like to lay that expectation out pretty early. Um, but then what, what doesn't always follow a perfect algorithm or blueprint is that recovery and that rehab. And so I think there's a, a lot of variation in the way that you can manage that. Very seldom do pediatric fractures um, need physical therapy, uh, but almost all of them, if they're trying to return to sports, are gonna need some rehab, whether that's with a physical therapist, an athletic trainer, somebody, they're gonna need somebody to help them transition back into return to play because they're, in doubt, they're no doubt gonna come out with weakness, stiffness, soreness, all those kind of things to work through. Um, but it, or to answer that question, I think it would be really easier to answer it with one specific injury than the kind of globally. Uh, but yeah, to your point, absolutely, they, they need something, especially these high school athletes that are trying to return, there needs to be that transition period. I think it, for the most part, my advice would be when the family comes up and, and they ask you if you get a chance to look at it, that obviously makes it easier. But if you don't, if it's sore, it's swollen, and it's not moving, um, you, you don't have x-ray vision, neither do I. Uh, give that thing a couple days, a day or two. If it's not doing a little bit better, that probably needs to be evaluated. You probably need to get an x-ray to look at it. Um, there are some, some injuries in the finger and the hand. Most of them do really well. Uh, but there are some of them that can that be problematic and have a poor sequela if we wait too long to get them evaluated and, and kind of get them fixed. Jared, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you guys for your time. Appreciate it.